If you're not aware of this going on right now, this video is going to blow your mind. So right now, there are 35 countries involved in a very big science experiment that's going to cost between 25 to 65 billion dollars. And so this is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or an acronym for that is ITER. Just to put into perspective of how much of a costing or a scientific commitment that is, I'll quickly outline the costs of what other great scientific advancements had costed us. And bear in mind, this is in today's dollars. And so the Mars Curiosity rover was $2.5 billion. The Manhattan Project was $3 billion. The Philadelphia experiment was Oh, that's classified. And the Hadron Collider that discovered the Higgs boson, that was $10 billion. So anyway, the fact that countries are willing to come together to spend this much money, it is kind of a big deal. But it's not the most expensive in history. It's just the most expensive that is going on right now. And just to point out some of the more expensive ones in history, the Apollo program would put us on the moon. That cost about $257 billion. And the International Space Station, that cost $150 billion and the shuttle program was $196 billion. But anyway, let's get back to the ITER project. So here's a list of all the countries that are putting in both money and expertise into making this reactor. Oh, hang on, I've got to cross off a country. And so with this vast international project, who is the lucky country that gets to host it? Well, it is France. And you may be thinking, hey, that's unfair. France also got a bit of a share of hosting the Hadron Collider as well. And wh why does France get all the cool stuff? Well, before you get too jealous about France, I do have to point out that hosting this science experiment does come with a lot of responsibility and with a lot of cost as well. And the reason that this is so costly is mainly because they need to upgrade the infrastructure around the port and also around the power plant itself. And so the parts for this reactor are being made all over the world in countries ranging from South Korea to India to the United States. And some of these parts are as high as four story buildings. That's not an exaggeration. And on top of that, some other parts weigh 900 kilograms, I mean 900 tons. I don't even know how a ship could carry that without sinking. I mean. How, how do they keep that afloat? And all up, there are about 10 million parts that need to be shipped into this reactor. So France had to upgrade their port that was near the town of Marseille to allow for such big, heavy and consistent machinery to be, be coming in and out of this reactor. And furthermore to that, they not only have to upgrade the port, they have to upgrade the roads to be able to stand that kind of weight from when it's been driven from the port to the reactor. And so that is a significant investment that they need to do for both their shipping port and the roads to the reactor. And also there's the reactor itself. And now I bet you're thinking, but well, what's so special about this proposed nuclear reactor? I mean, aren't there 441 reactors in the existence of the world right now? I mean, that's almost the amount of subscribers that Dave's YouTube channel has. Well, to explain what makes this reactor different is that all existing reactors use this process called nuclear fission. Whereas what they do is they get very heavy materials and then they go through this process where they split the atoms and then the release of electrons releases more energy and, well, we all know what the nuclear process is and we also know the pros and cons of this type of technology. Chernobyl! But this proposed reactor that they're trying to build now is not a nuclear fission reactor, it is a nuclear fusion reactor. And so the way this differs is that, is that instead of getting heavy particles and splitting the atoms, they're getting very light particles and then fusing the atoms together and having the electrons release in that form. And it is a very similar process to what keeps our sun alive. In fact, not only our sun, but basically every star in the universe, apart from brand dwarfs in case any astronomy nodes are watching. So to get really nerdy about it, the way this reactor works is that they get lithium and salt water and then they heat it up to 150 degrees. <laughs> oh wait, silly me, I forgot to say six zeros. That's 150 million degrees. And at this point, the atoms get hot enough where they fuse together to then release the electrons. The excess electrons are then released and that causes heat and basically energy to be created. So obviously this sounds great because we have a lot of salt water on this planet. And also for lithium, we have a lot of that as well. I know some of you may be stretching your heads right now thinking, but isn't there a lithium battery shortage? Well, yes, there is a shortage of materials for lithium batteries, but it's not actually the lithium itself that they're short on. There's actually plenty of that around the world. And these reactors do not even need that much of those materials anyway. And yes, I do need to address the elephant in the room. That is the word nuclear. So, is it radioactive? And is it safe? Well, 
It is a little bit radioactive, but it's much safer than a fission reactor. And this is the reason why. In a fission reactor, it causes a runaway chain reaction, which is why it makes such a great bomb. But in order to make this a power source, it relies on an external cooling system where it actually cool down all the materials involved to stop it from turning into an explosion. And so, if there is a failure in this cooling system, that's when you risk a runaway nuclear reaction. However, nuclear fusion is a very different process. With nuclear fusion, it requires an immense amount of energy to actually trigger their reaction. And the idea being that, that when nuclear fusion works, you then get some of the energy that it's generated, then feed a small amount back to it and then keep the process going. And so if there were to be a failure in that system, all you need to do is flick it off and a runaway chain reaction is not possible. And you may be thinking, but isn't this similar to the sun and isn't the sun just continually burning for billions and billions of years? Oh well, yes, but the sun has an immense amount of gravity of having this process going and the gravity is in levels that just does not exist on Earth. So it's not something that we need to worry about. And as for radiation, well, in a fission reactor, the materials that are exposed to the core are radioactive and dangerous to, for humans to be near for 10 million years. However, the materials exposed to a fusion reactor are only dangerous for approximately 100 years. So about one human's lifetime, approximately. So now I bet you're probably thinking, but okay, this all sounds too good to be true because if it was so great, why, why aren't all the nuclear power plants like this around the world? In fact, why not, not only the nuclear power plants, why isn't every power plant doing this? I mean, it doesn't even produce CO2. This is perfect. That now brings us to the point for why billions of dollars need to be spent on this is because it's not such an easy thing to achieve. I mean, they call this the holy grail of energy and I guess it wouldn't be a holy grail if it were easy. Now, to date, nobody has been able to create this nuclear fusion reactor by putting in less energy than what it takes out. There's a lab in the United Kingdom that has been able to generate 16 megawatts from an input of 24 megawatts. And so, obviously, it's a useless power plant if it takes more power to power it than what it produces. And so, to actually trigger this reaction, and because of a lack of gravity on Earth, in order to be able to get this fusion process to happen, we have to be able to heat up the core to 150 million degrees. And getting up to that temperature with using as little energy as possible, that is the challenge. If we can find a very efficient way to heat up that core, well then we will achieve nuclear fusion. So this all sounds great and it all sounds very promising, but when do we actually get to turn the key? Well, this is where a little bit of the bad news starts. It won't be until 2035. So with that being said though, they can start doing experiments and start doing trials on small levels in 2025, which is only three years from now. But before you think this is just some pie in the sky dream, you have to remember that this project was actually started in 1985. That's when this whole concept of having all these countries come together for this international project was first dreamt up. So with that being considered, we're past the halfway mark of this incredibly long journey to achieve nuclear fusion. And do you want to know something else that's pretty interesting about this that really surprised me? Is that there are no plans right now to connect this reactor to, to any French or European power grid. If it's not even planned to be used to power any grid anywhere, well then why is everyone doing this and why are so many countries willing to throw in so much money? Well, a big incentive is that it is completely open and transparent. And so if this experiment is to be successful, every country that's contributed to this will then be able to take that technology back to their home countries and build their own fusion reactors that can then power their grids. You may be thinking, but yeah, we, we do have a bit of a CO2 emissions problem and but we're, we're making headway in solar, we're making headway in wind, our batteries are getting better. Do we need to be bothering spending this amount of money in our energy production? And that is a valid question. But when you consider that roughly six trillion dollars is spent on energy production every year so that adds up to roughly 10 percent of the world's gdp and our requirement for energy is not going away either and so although there is always going to be a place for renewables such as solar and wind along with the batteries alongside them there's still going to be a demand for a large scale 24 7 energy production as well and so now we'll move on to what actually makes this program so expensive the most expensive component of this nuclear fusion reactor will be the core itself and so what is actually in this core, it's called Tokamak, which is basically in Russian an acronym for a toroidal chamber. It was thought up of by 1957 Soviet nuclear scientist Igor Golovin. And what this toroidal chamber is, is that through the use of electromagnetics, they can manipulate the magnetic field in, in the core and make it more cost efficient to be able to heat that 150 million degrees. And so with the electric magnetic materials that are around the core, it, it is surrounded by 18 strips. And in each of these strips, they weigh 
310 tons. Each one of his 310 ton strips is the same weight as a fully loaded 747. I mean, I barely even have enough subscribers to load a 747 and yet they're doing it with wires. And furthermore to that, they're not just doing it once, they've got 18 of these magnetic coils. So the equivalent weight of 18 747s bore and conducting metal wires. And, and that's not it either. There's also six polyidal magnets and there is a central solenoid which is strong enough to hold an aircraft carrier. Uh, I mean, have you seen those things? And this little core can hold it up if, it, if the aircraft carrier could withstand being lifted up in that way. I, I doubt that, that it could, but if it could, this thing would be able to hold it up. And do you want to know something else that's crazy about this project? Is that when it's finished, this facility will host both the hottest place on Earth, uh, which will be 150 million degrees, and the coldest place on Earth at negative 269 degrees. The reason that they need the coldest place on Earth is that they pre-cool the hydrogen before they fit it into the core, as it makes it more cost-effective to be able to do what it does, basically. So as I mentioned before, to date, the most efficient nuclear fusion reactor we've ever been able to create was done in England, and it was able to spit out 16 megawatts for being fed in 24 megawatts. But if all the theoretical models translate into the real world for this reactor in France, it'll be able to produce 500 megawatts for being able to feed in 50 megawatts. So there is a tenfold return on energy invested. And so this isn't just a pie in the sky dream as well. I mean. People have been dreaming and fantasizing about having nuclear fusion since the 1950s, but this is actually realistic, it is backed up by mathematics, and it's just a matter of actually physically building everything to back up the theoretical models that have been constructed and have been tested on smaller scales. So anyway, just of all of the bad things going on in the world, I think it's important this, that every now and then we, we talk about the positive things that are going on in the world that are going to make things incredibly better. I mean, imagine in 2035 that we have clean, safe and virtually infinite energy for the rest of humankind. So this is a very exciting watch of space and I, I really look forward to 2035 when this actually kicks into action and when the other countries can start applying the lessons from this experimental reactor and then start building their own around the world. So as per usual, uh, thanks for watching and really appreciate your attention and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Bye.